I've been wrestling with purpose. What was I created for? I'm more than what you see on the surface. See beneath my skin and scars, I'm skinned and scarred. Marred and twisted, scarred by the past I need to be lifted. And sometimes I question my own existence. What was I put here for? In my seams, it seems that there seems to be more. It's like I'm a light, unplugged from the socket. I mean, do I really exist to put money in my pocket? This nine to five feels like a nine to nine. My mind entwined, I pass the time, life circles me as I wait. What is my estate? I feel like I was made for something great and yet I can't quite put my finger on it. But when I look at my fingers and I see their design, I realize I'm one of a kind and something created me. No, someone created me and that someone made me for a reason. Even though it's clear the past years have been treason, I still sense this drawing, this calling that even in the midst of my falling, there was someone who died to pick me up, someone who rose to fix me up, someone who's coming back to lift me up. And that someone is Jesus. See, God made me for a purpose. And when I delight in him, it's brought to the surface. All right, it's good to see everybody this morning. I'm TJ. I'm Greek, which means we sweat abundantly. So if I sweat a little bit today, please do not be offended. I'm already into my second shirt. It's okay. Um, as we were rolling, I just felt like God spoke something strong to me. Um, sometimes we forget why we're here. Have you ever been sucked into life and you turn into this this person that just does the same thing every day at the same time, and it just goes on and on and on and on, and then you blink, and you look in the mirror, and you're like 40 years old, or you're 50 years old, or you're 60 years old. Well, just like us as people, churches sometimes, we lose our way. We forget why God put us here. The church was never designed to be this little hunker down, hold on, keep your head down till Jesus comes. The church was always designed to be an offensive force for the kingdom. Everywhere we go, the spirit goes. God created the church. When Jesus left, he said, he looked at Peter. When Peter declared who he was, he said, upon the knowledge of this, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not stand against it. Now, the last I checked, gates are not mobile. You put gates around things you're trying to protect. The church was never meant to be stationary. We're the ones that are you know, supposed to be doing incursions into darkness. So I felt that the thing that the Lord spoke to me today about New City, before we get into the talk, is that he is about to wake you up. You have been asleep for too long. You've turned inward. God is about to wake you up to turn you outward. You are positioned for kingdom purposes. Do you hear me, beloved? He's positioned you. The church is not brick and carpet. It's flesh, bone, and spirit. You're the church. So this is the time where we're going to rise. We're going to figure this out together. As we move forward, we are anchored to our past as a compass, but we are not restricted by how God moved back then. God is doing something new. I want to be about the new thing, the new wine. Amen? Um, so as I was praying, guys, I got to tell you this, it is, I've been like chomping at the bit to be here with you today. Uh, it is a privilege to stand here. Uh, your daughter church, Trinity, brings her regards. Thank you, mama, for all the stuff you poured into us. Uh, we stand with you. Uh, we, we're at your flank. Uh, we're there to help you to, uh, to get back to where God wants you to be. That's it, plain and simple. End of discussion. Uh, so as I was preparing, I was seeking the Lord. I'm like, God, what do you want me to share uh, with New City? And I feel like you, bought, you know, put something in my heart prophetically for what we are, where we're at right now as a people. So I'm just going to tell you this right now. Some of it is going to be great. You're going to laugh. You're going to amen me. You're going to think, man, this is the greatest thing ever. Some of it, 
You're going to be like, get the Greek out of here. <laughs> That's okay. How many of you know in all those things, God works things out? So don't take things personal today. Let your heart be tender. Yield and trust. And you'll be okay. So I was at the uh, supermarket the other day, about a week and a half ago now. And I'm, I'm entering into a different phase of life. I'm no longer the young buck. But I don't believe that I'm still, you know, the old buck that they're getting ready to take out yet. So I'm standing at the Acme, and I'm, I'm getting ready to check my stuff out. And this little girl, you know, the older I get, it's hard for me to judge how old these people are. This girl looked like she was 13. I know she couldn't be 13. She looked at me, and she goes, senior discount, sir? I was like, me? I, I wasn't prepared for that. Now, some of you are like, what's the big deal? You know, I'm 50 years old. I'm not ready for any senior discounts. So I was a little, a little befuddled. Have you ever been befuddled before? I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. So I thought I was going to be witty. And I, I said to the girl, I said, oh, and I said, no, sweetie. I said, no. I said, I'm not that old yet. I said, how old do you think I am? And a nervous laugh. Ha, 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 ha. And she looked at me. She said, sir, I really don't care. Senior discount? And at that point, I was upset that I did the survey before I paid for my groceries because Susie Q would have gotten like an F. And I realized something. You know, I'm not necessarily the person that I used to be. We are human beings. We're becoming something. We are growing. We are ever evolving. The person you are today is different than the person you will be tomorrow. Do you know that? Even your very skin, your cells, will continue to grow and die. And then when you get, you know, you leave them in your bed at night, you're constantly becoming something new. We have this life cycle, this thing that happens. Not just for us as humans, but also for us as churches. God is always doing new things with us as churches in new times. We're not just organizations. We're organisms. We grow. So how do we as a church navigate this process of becoming? If you've got your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18. I'm going to read this passage. It's familiar. I'm going to read it out of two different versions of the Bible today. This is Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. It says this. Forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. This is the, the passage again in the Passion Translation. It's interesting to me. It says this, stop dwelling on the past. Don't even remember those former things. I am doing something brand new, something unheard of. Even now it sprouts and it grows and matures. Don't you perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and open up flowing streams in the desert. So what do we glean from this passage today, prophetically, for New City Church? How's God using this as a compass for us? First, beloved, if you want to be in step with where God's taking you, you have to let go of the past. You have to. All of us do. Look at the passage again. Stop dwelling on the past. Don't even remember these former things. Now, know this. This doesn't mean that you just forget and you throw away all your heritage and all your stuff. We don't do that. The past is a beautiful thing. When you look at your past, you should, it should be just flooded with stories of God's faithfulness. How many of you have Facebook? One of the most beautiful things about Facebook is you get to kind of see, you ever see the, you know, the, the posts that come back up over and over and over again? I had a post come up that I, I posted 10 years ago. And that guy that was in that picture 10 years ago that looked like me, I don't, I don't even know who that guy is anymore. The past is a beautiful thing, and you build on it, and you, you celebrate all the good things that God has done in the past. You celebrate the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's a beautiful time to just kind of hang out and to remember, especially, you know, when you remember God's faithfulness. Um, but here's the challenge. Even though God encourages us to remember the past, you can't get stuck there. 
So you remember God's faithfulness. Like he tells us this in Psalm 143, 5. He says, remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you've done. I ponder the work of your hands. In Deuteronomy 32, 7, he says this. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he'll show you, your elders, and they'll tell you. The past is a beautiful place to ground us. But we have to be careful that we don't stay in the past. Beloved, we cannot live in the good old days. You can't. I, um, I remember a few years ago, my, my, my mom and my dad, you know, at some point, how many of you know you raise your parents again? You do. So I'm in, I'm in Denver, and my mom and dad would take turns going to the hospital. Eventually, my mom, she won, and God just took her to heaven. Because of the two, she was the nicer by far. So my dad came to live with us. And um, I didn't know how much time he had left. He had COPD. He could just have heart failure. A lot of things going on. And he, we decided, you know, my mother, you know, she didn't want to be a bird. And God took her the way that she wanted to. My dad wanted to be surrounded by family. Being Greek, we're just, it's just what we did. In my house, I had two ants die in our house. Because that's just what our people do. If somebody's sick, they go to the house that's got the most strength, the most people. They're there till, the, till, they, till they breathe their last breath and then they go on to Jesus. So my dad stayed with us. And um, before he came, I had an older brother in the church. And he said, TJ, he said, these, these times, these days you have with your father are a gift. Don't look at them as, they're not a burden. They're a gift. He said, cherish every moment. Remember every story. Don't be in such a hurry to get to all the stuff you got to do now. Sit there, remember, because when they're gone, they're gone. And I did that with my father. And we had beautiful memories, and we had beautiful times, and I will cherish all of those things. The day my father left this planet and he went on to be with Jesus, it was a beautiful time. And I'll be honest with you, every once in a while I get sad and I miss those conversations. Now I have you know, family members were, when my, when my dad left, they got stuck there. And every time we talk, they talk about the grief of losing my father. And, and I, if he was just here and I can't get through it, I can't get through it. And I encourage them. You celebrate the times that you had in the past, the old things, but don't get stuck in the loss. Don't get stuck in those things. Someday I'm going to have a new relationship with my father in heaven. He's going to be my brother and it's going to be beautiful. We're human beings. We are always becoming something. You anchor to the past, but it doesn't define you. It doesn't define your present now. Because we're ever changing. We're ever evolving. Even though you may not fully understand it yet. A few weeks ago, uh, actually probably about a month ago now, we were doing a community night on Wednesday night at uh, Trinity. And some of the young bucks decided they wanted to play basketball. So they needed some players... So me and Derek Gunn decided to throw our hats in the ring to help the young bucks out as they were playing. Now, some of these kids are like going to, to college on scholarships to play basketball. You would think that would deter me and Derek. It did not. Because in our minds, we're still like 31 years old. Right? So we went out there and we were fierce. Is that the right word, fierce? And, and, and I felt great for the first like seven and a half minutes. But I realized something. The things that my brain thought I could do were in direct opposition to the things my body could actually do. I remember I was standing next to two trees, these two young men, and I jumped as high as I could. And you could have almost slid a piece of paper under my feet. That's how high I got up off the ground. But that's not the worst part of it. The worst part of the whole thing is when you're done playing. I think I played one more game than you, right? You called out. Did you, did you, did you tag out early? Two and done. Two and done. I, I decided to go for that third one. I would say the third one did me in, but actually it was, it was halfway through the first one that did me in. I mean, here's the reality. We're not those people anymore. You may think you're that person in your mind, but you're not. Now, here's the challenge, too. I've done that enough when it comes to my wife, there's no sympathy. She's like, you should know better. I, I understand that. And, and her thought is until you figure it out, until you, you hit that wall enough, you're not going to know. Beloved, that's where we are as churches too. Don't define your now by what you used to be. 
figure out where you are now and go from there. If you don't do it that way, you're going to cause yourself a lot of heartache. You're going to be in a lot of pain because you can't do the things that you used to do. You just can't. So for us as a church, we have to understand that. As people, we have to, to come to terms with that. We celebrate the things we did in the past, but we don't live there anymore. We want to live in the now. Now, when it comes to the past, too, there's another element here that we got to deal with. It's not just celebrating all the good old times. Sometimes the past also houses some of our darker times. Some of you have allowed your past to define you now. And you can't do that. One thing happens. Sometimes we allow one bad chapter in the book of our life to be the rudder for everything that we are. And even though people may not hammer you with it, you hammer yourself with it. And even though God says, if you confess your sins to me, I'm faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. Even though he tells us all this stuff, we can't let ourselves off the hook. Beloved, let go of the past. Let go of it. The blood of Jesus is enough. If Jesus doesn't hold it against you, stop bringing it back up. The Bible says he takes our sins and he throws them as far as the east is from the west. It says he throws them into the sea he calls forgetfulness. Do me a favor. Stop fishing in the sea he calls forgetfulness for your stuff. Let it go. And then for us as a church, don't define people by their worst moments. Now, I know we don't do that here. Other churches do that. Let it go. Let it go. See people the way that God sees them. You are no longer a sinner saved by grace. You are a new creation in Christ. Breathe that in. You were a sinner. You're saved by grace, and now you're a new creation in Christ. He makes you new. Look at that cute girl that just came into the back. Isn't she cute? It's my wife, Robin. She got here a little late. Give it up for Robin. Do me a favor. We're just going to pause real quick. Just shut your eyes for one second. Give the Holy Spirit an opportunity right now to help you to let go of some of those things. If there are things that are holding you back, right now have a conversation with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks to you just like he speaks to me. Ask him, say, Holy Spirit, will you show me how to let this go? The goal is to walk into freedom. All right, so that's the first thing. If you want to be in alignment with what God's doing now, you have to let go of the past. The second thing you have to do is this. You have to embrace the new. Look at the passage again. You can go to the next slide. It says, I'm doing something brand new, something unheard of. Even now it sprouts and it grows and it matures. Don't you perceive it? Even now in your life, God is doing something new. That's not like debatable. He's just doing something new. This is the thing that we struggle with. Do you see it? Do you perceive it? Sometimes we're so consumed, you know, consumed with the way that we do things, the old way of doing things, that we don't see the new thing that God's doing. We're so focused in our little worlds, we don't see outside of that thing. When I was pastoring in Denver, I was introduced to this beautiful food that I didn't really know about until I got to Denver. It's called a burrito. Have you ever had a burrito? So in Denver, they got these burritos, but they have this garnish called green chili. It's got like pork in it and stuff like that, and it's, it's like heaven. I'm sorry, did I, did I tear up a little bit? Now, God in his love for me put right next to our church in Denver the greatest burrito store ever called Santiago's. Every morning, I would get to the church, I'd take a little walk to Santiago's, I'd buy me two breakfast burritos with the green chili, not the hot, Greeks don't like hot stuff, just flavorful, and I would say every morning, I'm going to eat one of these and I'm going to give one of these away. 
And every morning, I would eat two burritos. <laughs> the Lord's still working on me. I'm in, pro I'm in process, okay? So one day I go over there, and, this, and the place is small. I mean, you go in there, you get five people in there, you're like touching shoulder to shoulder. I'm having a bad day. I'm just trying to figure stuff out. It's early in the morning, and I have all this stuff on my mind. And I'm in there, my head's in the ground, and blah, 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 blah. And as I'm waiting for my two burritos, I hear this booming voice next to me saying, aren't you going to say hi? I look up, and next to me is my church secretary, Thurston Birdwell III. We called him Bird. He is from Texas, and he talked like this. Now, Bird was 400 pounds, 6'3", beautiful white hair, big white beard. He played Santa Claus during the holiday season. I'm standing in a room that's probably 15 by 15, Bird's standing right next to me, and I don't even notice him. Why? I'm so focused on my own stuff, I don't perceive everything else that's going on around me. Sometimes we do that, beloved, when it comes to the new thing that God's doing. Don't be so locked into your stuff, you can't perceive what God is wanting to do now. Not just in your church, but in you. Do you know that God's always wanting to do something new in you? He's always moving us along. He's always expanding the kingdom inside of us. <clears throat> Sometimes we struggle with the new. Sometimes we even resist the new. Facebook comes out with a new update. Uh, this day, they move the button from the right side to the left side. People lose their minds. I remember when my dad was staying with us, my dad brought with him, you know, we, we had not lived with anybody, you know, my dad had, had a lot of miles on those tires. And my dad had one of the first, like, flip phones. Remember the flip phones? He had a Verizon flip phone. I think it was like, like 12 years, it was crazy. I mean, it was amazing. He lost his power supply one day, and I went into the Verizon store to get another one, and they, they laughed at me. They said, we ain't seen that phone in five years. I said, do you have these? I said, no, but can we look at it? Because we've only heard of these. We've never seen these phones. So finally, my dad's flip phone died. So I go to the Verizon store. My dad says, I want the same phone. I said, Dad, I don't make this phone anymore. He says, what do I do? I said, we got to get you a new phone. I said, how about an iPhone? And I handed my dad my iPhone. He looked at me. This is, I'll never be able to learn this. I said, well, Dad, I don't know what else to do. I said, trust me, it'll be great. You can get on Facebook. Oh, that stuff's gone. I just want my own phone. Why does everything have to change? So finally, we couldn't find any other phones. So I said, Dad, I'm, I'll teach you. you know, technology with your dad. I'll, give you, I'll teach you, Dad. So my dad went from hating this phone to this phone becoming the greatest thing that he'd ever encountered. Because he learned Facebook. He could talk to all of our Greek family back in Pittsburgh. My dad learned how to send texts, which was an awful thing. <laughs> he would send texts to me and my brother all the time, like, hey, I saw a cat today. <laughs> great, thanks, Dad. I, that's great. He even came in one day. <laughs> he asked me, he goes, TJ, he goes, how tough is it to bring somebody over from Russia? I said, Dad, who are you talking to on your phone? I said, let me see your phone. And he got onto a, a, a dating site. He was looking for my new mom. He was 77. This is the name of the site. Ready for this? Meetagreek.com. I said, Dad, we're not meeting any more Greeks. Find you a nice lady down in the church. Before you, you pick her out, you show me who she is because we got to pray for that woman now. Couldn't get that phone out of my dad's hands after a while. Guys, it's not that we don't like new things. We just want new things our way. How many of you know that um, we work for God, God does not work for us? He's the one that sets the standards. He's the one with the game plan. I think I heard this in the word before. Didn't Jesus say, I will build my church? So our job as churches is to be in alignment with the heart of God. If you're partnering and you're in alignment with what he wants to do, how many of you know that it's blessed? Sometimes we want to do our thing and pray that God blesses it. Let's just figure out what he wants to do. So we know this, God is always doing something new. So what is our job as believers while he does these new things? It's very simple. To perceive it. We just got to figure out what God is doing. He's always changing things. He's changing us. Your faith is evolving. Do you know that? 
Do you know that the prayers of a 20-year-old are different than the prayers of a 70-year-old? They are. I pray for each of my children every day. I send them a text every day praying for you. And I'm saying, I'm praying for this specifically for you. And it's funny, depending where my kids are at, my older ones are like, thanks, Dad. My younger ones are like, ugh. Which makes me want to pray all the more. <laughs> we grow. Your faith is evolving. Your faith is growing. Everything continues to grow. It's our job to perceive what God wants to do now in us. How he wants to use us now. This is why it's important that you know God. You don't just know about him. It's more than head knowledge. It's heart knowledge. It's intimacy. That word perceive in the Hebrew is an interesting word. It's yada. And it means to know. But not to know with your head. It's a heart knowledge. It conveys intimacy. To know really, you know, what something is. It's the same word that God used in Genesis 4.1 when it talked about how Adam knew Eve. It says, now Adam knew Eve, Yada, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain saying, I've gotten a man with the help of my Lord. The same word, Yada. So what is God saying through this? He wants you to know and connect with him intimately. When you're connected to him intimately, you'll always be in step with a new thing that he's doing. He's the vine, you're the branches. It's our job to stay connected to the vine. As long as your proximity is next to the vine, you won't miss the new thing. The further we drift, the more we lean on our own understanding, the easier it is for us to miss what God wants to do now. Know him. Know his heart. Spend time in prayer. Don't miss the bus. Don't be left behind. And don't be a barrier to what God wants to do in your life and in the life of your church. So every, uh, every year, you know, churches, we have our, our cycles. The summertime for us is when we sharpen our axes. At Trinity, we do strategic planning. We seek the Lord. This is how we're built. By November... We've been praying and seeking the Lord, and I put our teaching calendar out in November for the whole next year, 2023. The Bible says that man makes his plans, but God directs our steps. That means this, you know, everybody's a pretty good idea what we're doing through the whole year, but there's always room in what we're doing for God to go left. If he says go left, we just go left. Why? Because we work for him. He doesn't work for us, right? So as I was seeking the Lord earlier this summer, I felt the Lord spoke this strongly to me as I was asking the Lord for direction for TCC, even for you guys. I felt like what God told me was, son, I've poured a lot of things into you. And I've prepared you to do a lot of things. Don't be, don't be, be tethered to how I've impacted you in the past. I'm going to do something new in you and through you. I'm going to use your experience and stuff, but I'm going to come in a way that you're not even, you're not even prepared to see yet. Just hang on and trust me. So he's been beating on me to lay down my understanding of what I think all this stuff will be. It's not my job to figure it all out. It's, it's my job to stay close to God, yada, to stay connected, and to allow God to build his church. That's my job. I don't have to come up with all this stuff. I want to encourage you. Get close to him. Allow the Lord to shift your understanding even the boxes maybe that we've created for him and how he could do things. Does that make sense? Don't lose heart, beloved. So first, how do we stay connected with what God wants to do? We let go of the past. Second, we embrace the, future. We embrace the new. And third, we trust for the future. Look at the passage. You can go to the next slide. This is what God says he'll do for us. I will make a way in the wilderness and open flowing streams, open up flowing streams in the desert. Now this is interesting. Sometimes when it comes to the Bible, we'll take words that are on the pages of the Bible and we'll take our understanding of what we think that is. And sometimes it lines up perfect. Sometimes it's, it's different. Sometimes the translations, what they mean by, you know, what's in Hebrew and what's in English, sometimes those, those languages don't mesh perfectly. So when you look at this wilderness, what was, what was God talking about 
in this wilderness. What is this wilderness? Well, back in Jesus' day, it was, a, uh, it was a desert place, a wild place, an untamed place. The Hebrew word used here for wilderness is midbar. And what's interesting is the people of the day referred you know, to deserts as midbar, these wild places, they would take their animals to graze, which doesn't mean, it's not just desert and, and lifeless. There's life there, it's just untamed. But the actual meaning of the word, you ready for this? It actually means mouth in Hebrew. Midbar. And it's taken from the root word darbar, which means to speak. Now what's interesting about this is the idea that God would use the wilderness, the desert, to bring his people into alignment with what he was trying to tell them. Can you think of any biblical examples where people were taken into the wilderness and God got their attention in the wilderness? Sometimes it took them 40 years. Why? They did not perceive it. Yada. Here's the land. It's for you. Eh, two out of ten perceived it. Well, ten, two out of ten is not enough. Turn around. Let me speak to you again. Forty years till you figure it out. How many of you want to know you don't want to be on that group tour, right? Do you know how long? This is nuts. You want to know how long it would take if you were to walk from Egypt to Canaan in a straight line? You know how long that journey takes? Get any idea? Two weeks. You get the gold star. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> How long were they in the wilderness? 40 years. 40 years. So you have this wilderness area where God speaks. This desert place, this wild place that's different where God speaks. Why does God take you into these lonely places? Sometimes he takes you into these lonely places so that all the distractions can be stripped away and you can hear him clearly. We see this modeled in the life of Jesus, don't we? Right after Jesus' baptism, he's empowered with the Holy Spirit. We see him in the desert, right? He goes in the desert and what happens? The enemy starts to test him. Does he go in the desert to be tested by the enemy? Is that the purpose of the desert? What is the purpose of the desert? Let's read the passage together. This is uh, Matthew. Just to, to reacquaint it and ask the question again, we get done. Then Jesus was led by the... By the what? Big S. So who's that? The Holy Spirit. One of the big three, right? And Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. During that time the devil came and he said to him, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the scripture says, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Verse 5, then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and he said, if you're the son of God, jump off, for the scriptures say, he will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands, so you won't even hurt your foot against a stone. Then Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. Verse 8, next the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. I'll give it all to you, he said, if you kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil went away, and the angels came and took care of Jesus. What was the purpose of the desert? We know that the delivery system, the preparation came from the temptation. Why did the Spirit lead Jesus there? To speak to him. To point him. He was fully empowered. What was his path after that? To be fully led by the Spirit. How many of you know that your future is in good hands 
if you trust your future to the Spirit. If you're led by the Spirit, right? Now, how many of you know that being led by the Spirit sometimes is unsettling? Sometimes it's scary. Sometimes it's not comfortable. How many of you know that God is not concerned with your comfort? He's not. He's concerned with your purpose. He's concerned that you live and become everything he created you to be. Most of the time, that will not be parallel with your comfort. It's funny. I remember um, I'm weird. Sometimes I'm just weird. Um, I remember when we started to have children. You know, your whole perspective, you know, perspective on life changes when you have kids. I remember when, when, when my eldest son, Tyler, you know, arrived. It was the first time in my life I'm looking at this kid. I'm thinking, this kid can't do anything by himself. You know, I'm the protector. He can't, he can't do anything. He can't eat. He can't do anything. And this, this holy burden puts on, is put on your heart. You know, Robin, you know, back in the day, you know, she could take care of herself. But these kids, what are they going to do? And with that, that, that whole, with that whole understanding, um, sometimes we overly protect our children. I'd pray every night. I'd pray, pray every night for Lord, keep this son, keep my son safe. We almost lost him. That's another story. Son, keep or God, keep him safe. Protect him. Protect him. Protect him. And I'm praying that over him one night, like I did every night. And I felt the Holy Spirit say, "Stop." I said, I just keep him safe. Just stop. And I'm like, okay, Lord, why should I stop praying for my child to be safe? He says, I want your child to be safe, but don't pray for his safety. Pray that he would be fully in the purpose that I have for him. Because the center of my will is the safest place he could ever be. Even if that takes him across to the other side of the world. Even if God sends him as a missionary to Japan or to, to Africa or to India. It may not look safe to you, but it's safe to me. Pray for purpose, not just protection. So I changed the way that I prayed. And then we had my daughter, Tori, and everything got turned upside down. That's all I'm going to say about that. Being led by the Spirit is not easy. But if you want to be a church that God wants to use, where the kingdom can flow, that's the only thing that we can be, beloved. We're a spirit-filled body. We are empowered and propelled by the Spirit. That means that the road may look different to us than what we think it's going to be. That may not mean that it's safe and it's probably definitely not going to mean that it's comfortable. But still we follow. So maybe God had you in the wilderness. That's not, it's not bad company to be in the wilderness to hear God's voice. Jesus modeled that for us, right? Luke 5.16 says this, Jesus often withdrew into the wilderness to pray. So what happens in these desert, desert experiences that help us to uh, connect with God uh, so deeply? Sometimes, beloved, in order for God to position you for your purpose, he has to put you in a position to strip away all the other things that distract you. He's got to get you back down to the studs. He's got to get you back down to the core. Sometimes it's just what he has to do. The desert place isn't just a place where God could speak more clearly for your direction. It's also a place that he can address our heart. To position our hearts to be able to receive and to walk in what he has for us. All of us have things sometimes that keep us from um, maybe stepping into those new things. Fear. Doubt. We've never been there before. Sometimes we don't understand God's blueprint. How many of you know that's okay? You don't have to understand it all. You just trust. You know, God does not have to explain his purposes to you. He is God, we're not. I was in uh, Wisconsin before we got to uh, Trinity. I had a weird thing happen. I'm in my, my mid-40s, and I started to get incredible back pain. And I started to uh, have issues with my right foot. It'd go numb. It'd hurt real bad, and then it would go numb. I was an athlete in college and did all kind of stuff. Didn't know what to do, so I went to the doctor. How many of you know the doctors practice medicine? 
Sometimes they practice on you. You ever been frustrated with a doctor? You get frustrated? Yeah. So I go in there and they say, send me to physical therapy. Nothing. They say, we're going to give you shots. Nothing. All that's happening just keeps getting worse. It's so bad I can't stand for more than about five minutes and teach. I got to sit on a stool. I can't sleep through the night. I've got constant pain. My wife will tell you, I would crawl from the bed to the shower and just lay in the tub just to get a little bit of relief. So after about nine months of going through this, they decided to take pictures of my back. And they found out that between my, my L4 and my L5, there was a rupture. There was nothing there anymore. And, and I was killing the nerve there. There's two, the two nerves that run down. So I'm sitting in the doctor's office, and I'm like, okay, so what, what's, what do I do? He says, well, these are your choices. He says, either we go in and we fix it, or you'll be in a wheelchair in a year. I'm like 40-some years old. I got young kids. And I'm like, well, I don't want to be in a wheelchair. Um, he says, now I got to tell you, the surgery is pretty rough. It's an eight-hour surgery. The recovery is, you know, you'll be able to walk, but your full recovery is not going to be for a year and a half, two years. He says, is this something you want to do? I remember talking to Robin and saying, well, I don't, I don't know what to do. And, and we prayed, and I, we felt like the Lord said, just trust me in this. It'll be okay. And, you know, how many of you know doctors give you the worst-case scenario because they don't want to get sued? <laughs> right? So my doctor gives us the worst case scenario and I'm like, Lord, I, I don't understand all this. And I just kept getting this overwhelming thing. TJ, trust me, just because you haven't seen it, don't believe that I'm not gonna be there with you. So I go through the surgery, we start the recovery process and in my mind, I already have in me limitations. So when I, when I, before the surgery, I I'd already put in my mind, I'll never be able to do this with my kids again. I'll never be able to do that again. I'll probably be this, this will probably be all. And I have all these things laid out and the crazy thing happened. I, I go through the surgery, and I start to heal. And as I heal, I didn't realize how bad my back was before. So that happened about four and a half years ago. And not only am I able to do all the stuff that I did before, but God brought back even stuff that I'd lost years ago that I even forgot I'd lost. All because of that process. All because of that medical adjustment I was out golfing with my kids the other day. I mean, think from back you know, to golfing, and I whip my boy's tail. It's not enough to go out there, but when you whip their tail, it's better. We don't know perfectly what the future holds, but we know that we can count on the one that, that's already been there. Right? The Bible says this in, uh, in Proverbs. Proverbs 3, 5 says this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he'll show you which path to take. What is that? That's the God that does something new. That's the God that brings streams in the middle of the desert. That's the God that shows up and we've done all that we know to do. He's the one that makes up the rest. So, new city. God is doing something new in this season. Are you ready to let go of the pain of the past? This is one of our six churches in the assemblies in the Pendel District that's over 100 years old. There is heritage here. I'm looking at this picture. This is nuts. You see this picture? But all these, you see it every time you walk in, all these people. Do you know that almost every person in this picture is dead? I mean, nobody killed them. They're just dead. We don't live here anymore. I believe God will do not this, something greater in this next season if you trust him. If you trust him. The church is more than brick and, and, and wood and carpet. It's flesh. It's blood. Now, I've got to be honest with you. I don't know how he's going to do all this. All I know is this. From the first time I came on the property here, probably a year and a half ago now, I remember touching these walls, and I felt destiny. This is an ancient beacon that God has not put out. 
she's supposed to burn. She's supposed to draw like a lighthouse people back into the fold. Let go of the pain of the past. Let go of the reasoning and trying to figure out why you are in this place you're in right now. And understand this. The Spirit sometimes calls us into the desert to refocus us, to empower us for the task that He has in the new season. Behold, I am doing something new. Do you not perceive it? Yada. Know it, perceive it. Let's believe that God does something great. So this is what I want to do real quick as we end. I didn't even know what time I was supposed to end. I didn't even look at a clock. Am I late? Okay. I don't know. Maybe, maybe Pastor Vernon preaches forever. I don't know. When we talk about church, the church is more than these doors in this, this room. You are the church. The new thing that God wants to do starts in your heart. It starts in your spirit. It starts in your speech. It starts in how God knits your heart together with him and how he knits your heart together with each other. That's where this begins. The church is a people, not a place. You are the church. I am the church. This all starts with giving the Holy Spirit an opportunity to speak to our hearts. So bow your heads real quick. This is the question that I want you to ask the Holy Spirit. Ask him, say, Spirit, am I ready to embrace this new thing with you? Am I ready? And listen to what he tells you. In this moment, the Holy Spirit will shine his light on your heart, on your spirit, and show you where you are and where he wants you to be. We got these GPSs in our cars. And the only way they work, you can't know where you want to go until you know where you are. You need two points. Allow the Holy Spirit to show you where you are. And then give him permission to point you into the direction he wants you to go. Lord, we thank you for our time together. We pray that, Father, you would continue to unfold your plan to us. Help us, Lord, to be in perfect alignment with your heart. Give us ears to hear you, eyes to see you, and hearts, Lord, that fully respond to you. We're yielded to you, Lord, and we trust you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. whatever the Lord spoke to you, do it. Be it. I'm excited to see what God's going to do in the future with us. Amen?